since I was a kid, I always got a kick out of my dad referencing this uh, Coach Woody Hayes quote. And even though I'm a Purdue Boilermaker proud, we'll uh, we'll quote Coach Hayes on this one. But you know, it, it was kind of this uh, this idea of how stubborn he was about not throwing the ball, and he would say. When you throw the ball in America, back to an American football story here, Tori, <laughs> when you throw the ball, there are three things that can happen and two of them are bad. So we're going to run the ball. I was thinking about that as it pertains to branding. And like, I think there are like three core types of rebrands and maybe there's a fourth, but definitely one of them is bad. So I think that's something we should unpack a little bit. Um, you know, I think there's, maybe the most holistic version of a rebrand, just high level, that is there are things you wanna work in, work on internally and then you want to uh, reflect that externally. So that's like a holistic rebrand where things are happening inside, things are happening outside, everybody sees the results in the end. Then the second one is what I kind of dubbed the fresh face on a great place. So it's a really great organization. And a lot of times these could be nonprofits or organizations who have great people, great processes. They just literally have a dated look and they want to refresh what that brand's about. And so they change things externally to reflect what's already great on the inside. And then there's the one that I call the window dressing, which is we're maybe not in a great spot and got some bad PR. So maybe if we update our look, people will check us out again. And I, that's not a great, <laughs> that's my least favorite one to be involved in when they know they have the hard work to do inside and they just aren't doing it. Um, so those are the three kinds. And then, you know, potentially the fourth is like the, just because like there, maybe there wasn't anything they wanted to change on the inside. Maybe the outside wasn't dated, but they just launched a new look. Uh, you've probably been down the grocery aisle and you've gone to pick up your favorite package, pop tarts or cereal or something. And something is different with the visual package and you're not sure why, and it doesn't really make any sense, but so that's potentially the fourth kind. Um, and of course we've had this really big prominent, uh, rebrand of sorts happening on social media here lately. And I thought maybe we should unpack which one of the kinds X slash Twitter is about and, and why. Awesome, man. Dude, I love the breakdown and <clears throat> it speaks to the timing of this. Obviously the Twitter X thing is on top of everybody's mind. So this is a really beautiful opportunity for us to talk about this thing because I've noticed headlines all over the place using the word rebrand. And it's so interesting to watch it being used to describe something uh, in this case, that is, we'll talk about, I, I think I know which version of the rebrand it is, but we'll talk about that. Um, but they wait until the acute moment of that logo being updated until they start using that word rebrand. So I think from the outside, the layman, the, you know, journalists, the people who don't spend, you know, any real amount of time in uh, our space use that word. And mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to kind of unpack that part too. So, um, the, the, the primary word that I keep thinking about and coming back to just hearing you describe the three and a half <laughs> different types of <laughs> rebrands, um, is alignment and alignment is a word that I use a lot when I talk about the value of a, an effective brand strategy and how you deploy that brand strategy, um, literally into every single tiny little nook and cranny of your company's existence. Mm-hmm. So this alignment idea for if we just let's go ahead and start breaking down the types of rebrands, right? So my impression from the very beginning, the first one is that we we legitimately are changing the entire inner workings and infrastructure of our company. You know, we literally could be pivoting. Let's just take to the most extreme example. You know, we used to create widget A. Now we offer services that are not related in any way, shape or form, you know, to that. Obviously, and we can talk about that could about, happen with uh, an addition of staff. It could happen with the addition of technology. It could happen with an acquisition. You you brought on another team who has a whole another division that that you didn't have before. So a lot of different ways that that could that could take place too. 
That's right. There's there's a, a tons of different um, triggers, these little moments that would get people to start thinking about, you know, what do we need to do here? What do we need to change? Even if they're not using the word rebrand at all, you know, it's just that business adapting and, you know, all um, judgment aside of what the best tactic for that is. I mean, you could you could see one saying, no, 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 we're going to keep the uh the name for example and all of our identity and everything but we're going to completely change from a product to a service or something um you know that's probably not the smartest move <laughs> on the planet like we're probably talking about like <laughs> legitimately spinning off a new you know brand or something like that but the point is if you're making some massive fundamental shifts under the hood and turning this thing into something completely different and yet you keep the the outward expression of your company's existence the layer that everybody interfaces with from you know logo to customer service language to you know the product itself the what i expect to solve with your product or your service all of those things if those start to change but the thing that allowed me to identify and perceive your company and your brand doesn't change there's no signal whatsoever that these changes are happening and so I don't understand like, well, hang on, what's going on here? And on the flip side, what you call window dressing, which I love your um, slightly more B2B friendly language to my lipstick <laughs> on a pig <laughs> reference, right. which is also the same sentiment, um, which is to say there's no change going on under the hood at all. We just wanted to create, create this whole new perception on the front end, but we're not actually fundamentally changing anything. And I think from yours and my experience, we've almost always encountered that in a circumstance where they're trying to create a perception that's not true to what's really going on. And we have a negative association with that moment, right? And yeah. You, and well, said, it's like, the thing that everybody says all the time, and you're probably tired of saying this yourself, which is your logo is not your brand. However, when, when you launch a rebrand, if you don't have something visual that changes, you don't really get the opportunity to tell that story or explain what has changed because the visual becomes the signal to the market that something changed here. Look at what's different. The same way that I mentioned with the pop tarts, like I pick up the package and something is different of whatever the food is. I don't need pop tarts, but <laughs> <laughs> you pick up the package and you're like, wait, what changed? is yeah. it new formula new ingredients am i still gonna like it you know it, right. it signals something to me that something happened so even if nothing did happen that visual triggers that at least in my mind yes i oh i totally think so it's a cue and that's that's what's interesting to me because so this idea of alignment because we're not much to the chagrin of my, many business leaders we are not talking about these perpetually homeostatic ex uh, businesses and organizations that can never change, adapt, or move, or shift, right? Even if a company thinks that it can remain that way, technology, social perceptions, you know, expectations, all of that changes. And so that immediately repositions you. I talk about that all the time. You, you don't, you never own one position at any given time. I don't care what anybody says. That position is always fluid, always. You can do nothing different, but the rest of society can change, and now your positioning has changed. You can do nothing different, but a competitor can change and now your positioning has changed because you don't own your positioning yeah the market owns your positioning and we talk about the same thing with brand or maybe so when you talk it's just always at risk like there's no guarantee that even though you you feel like you own that position this week you know things could change that have nothing to do with you or everything to do with you and then that that position's at risk again yeah 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 and i i i like to identify with the like it's 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 not static it's fluid because you can also have the competitor who epically screws up and next thing you know, they're all calling you, right? So it can, mm -hmm. it can actually be your advantage. Most of the time, it's probably more in risk mitigation territory for sure, as you say, because it signals that you are not moving and growing along with those shifts and those changes. So what this presents to me is it's almost this sense of like a geyser and how you have this under the ground activity going on. This is interesting to me right now because I've never used this. This is all real time, folks. So um, as Josh knows, I Metaphors trademark. While you wait. <laughs> yeah, I literally trademark and label and try to encapsulate everything into easy to understand uh, concepts. So it, it really is like this geyser that under the ground, all of these machination, machinations are happening. All this stuff is going on. That's going to lead to the outward expression later of the geyser, the old faithful, you know, eruption or whatever the the pressure kind of has to build in an organization for those changes to start to happen to accumulate you're not going to unroll a brand new logo 
you know, an identity campaign and, and marketing campaign and messaging and try to get people to understand what you're doing differently, like one week into the committee on how do we adapt to the new market, right? You're just going to end up doing that every week. And now you don't have any anchors to really kind of, you know, work with. So there's going to be a lag time. And we're still talking about category number one, where there's the fundamental shifts, changes, and innovations going on in an organization that could ultimately lead to us completely revitalizing how we uh, describe ourselves and the perceptions that we want to make sure align with the reality of who we are now, because we're changing. So there's this really interesting ebb and flow, and I feel like there's a pressure that has to build kind of over time before we go out to that sort of public-facing side of our you know existence and say, now here's the cue. This is what we've done. And I think that's the interesting thing because X is exactly that. From the moment that Elon walked into that building with that sink, if you remember the little mm -hmm, stunt he right. pulled, you know, with the sink, that was the beginning of the rebrand. And really, truly, if I'm thinking about it, it's in Elon's head even prior to that. But that's the real moment of like the rebrand is starting right now and it's ongoing. Well, I think I wanna... that's a good example too of. Um, I tell my clients all the time, it'd be really great since we've decided to do this rebrand if we just close our doors for 6, 12, 18 months and get everything straight and then come back to market. Well, the problem is nobody can do that yep. <laughs> or effectively nobody can do that. And uh, you still have to maintain something in the market as you're changing all the things. So even if the moment he walked in the door or when he tendered the offer to purchase Twitter, that he had this whole plan in his head, he's still got to be Twitter. He's still got to do all the things that they're doing. He's still got to deal with customer service. He's still got to deal with uh, improvements to the product and break fixes and releases and, and all the things that come with operating that particular platform uh, and trying to make money with it. So uh, you can't <laughs> just bury your head <laughs> because the you've got to build that geyser pressure up, I suppose, to... Yeah. to continue with your metaphor. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for continuing with that one. The um, I use the term logical extensions. Mm -hmm. So when I work with my clients, I talk about this idea that we don't want to just throw something completely out of left field to them overnight and impose this new thing on them, right? Because there's they have already formed this set of expectations. You're already positioned in their mind. They already understand you compared to your uh, competition. They understand you at your pro uh, price point, your value set. They understand all of those things right now. So if we shock them with something completely different, that is a very unstable place to be. So we want to slowly introduce these logical extensions that signal the bigger announcement, the pressure release, right? So maybe that's the ground that shakes a little bit or the steam starts to rise a little bit and you kind of go, okay, I see something's happening under here. It'll be interesting when that unveils. In the case of Twitter X, this is probably, you know, visually for people, this is probably one of the most like shocking transitions from one, you know, <laughs> visual perception standard to another, right? You've got the like flighty little cute bird to literally Elon's obsession with X. That is very stark for people. Mm -hmm. That's very hard for them to ingest. And they they react negatively to it. You know my opinion on all of the like, look at so-and-so making their new rebrand online and all the little forums that everybody loves to pick apart and say the new logo sucks. And they go, yay, I'm so smart and wonderful because I recognize that this new logo sucks. And then 12 months later, everybody's like, that logo's great. It's wonderful. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? So anyway, with that said, what I look at is, well, what changed on the platform? And I obviously spend more time there than you do. Yeah. When that new logo landed, very little, if anything, changed. I know there was a couple interface tweaks to the like mobile app or something like that. No big deal, right? These changes have been happening. Like anybody using Twitter for the last 12 months has actually experienced that underground pressure building change that's going on under there. But now because there's a new logo on it, everybody goes ballistic. And that's the power of these symbols. That's the power mm. of these icons. That's why these things matter to us. That's why we emphasize really powerful persuasive visual and verbal uh, communication in what we do because they actually speak to the things that are going on behind the scenes. Now, maybe the we should say this just to, or at least my opinion is the brand rollout could have been handled differently. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because if he had called us, we might've advised yes, slightly in, different, uh, but in, in a typical Elon fashion, he just did what he felt like. Uh, which is not to say that the rebrand was a him just doing what he felt like, but I think the way it was handled 
maybe could have been a little less abrupt or a little less uh, jarring in that, uh, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot, and I don't know if this is the case with with the X Twitter thing or not, but I think one of your your most important, if not the most important audience during a brand relaunch is your internal audience. So you want to make sure that your internal team knows what's happening and not just what's happening, but why it's happening. What's the strategy here? What are we trying to do differently? What's the timing? Because if you send that internal email that's about, hey, the new website or the new logo goes live this afternoon, like you can just hear the eyes rolling. It's just like the worst possible thing that you can do with the brand launches to not have the internal team on board. So in addition to that, like having your your most important clients and users and media partners and those things all also on board with the story and just with the abruptness of how this came out and how uh, <laughs> it seemed to be not the most positive response to the rebrand. It just kind of makes me wonder like how many of those steps were actually checked along the way. It is interesting. And, you know, we, we use that sort of like concentric circle thing, right? Where you have, mm -hmm. you know, the leadership and then the team and then the core customer set, and then the sort of like legacy users and then out to the broader public. Right. And as you go through any shifts or changes strategically, or in this case, you know, in a, in a rebrand in the purest sense of the word, you want to make sure you've got that alignment in that sort of in out inward toward outward progression. Right. We have no data, or at least I have seen nothing about how this was handled internally for them. Um, but I, I would suspect that anybody who is still part of the internal team there is is fully aware and fully on board and has adapted to the idea that, you know, Elon is the guy who's going to still be sort of calling those shots, even though Linda is obviously the CEO. I my personal take and I am somebody who has been known for decades in his circle for not giving an opinion on another person's business when I'm not sitting in the boardroom and have I have been. Uh, very publicly mouthy towards people who are because they're judging <laughs> uh, business decisions when they don't have the data. And I find that to be uh, an epic waste of time and very egocentric and useless. So my assumption here is the internal team knew very well and was mm -hmm. well aware of it. Obviously, some had to because they unrolled it um, and worked with teams who did unroll it. So that's my assumption. My other contention with this is we have to understand brand hierarchies. And my contention has been that the moment, again, that Elon walked into that building with the sink, Twitter's brand was no longer Twitter. It was Elon. From that moment forward, the brand is now a, a, a child brand. We could talk about parent brands, you know, like the, the master, you know, parent brand, sub brand structure or whatever parent child brand. Mm -hmm. Twitter became a child brand of Elon. And if there's one characteristic of Elon's brand, it is absolutely that Elon's going to do what Elon wants to do when he wants to do it. This is the most on-brand thing that Elon could have possibly done. And that's where I want people to understand that you, we are not dealing with some publicly traded, risk-averse, terrified, oh my God, the you know board or the shareholders are going to have me fired, typical vanilla run-of-the-mill corporation here. We are dealing with a once-in-a-lifetime phenom who doesn't think like anybody else. I don't care if you love him or hate him. That is just simply a, a matter of objective observation with how this man works and behaves. This is the most on-brand thing he could have possibly done. And in a world of terrified and beholden to the board the way Twitter was before, when we followed the story of Twitter bleeding cash like crazy and they had no innovative ideas whatsoever leading up until the moment that Elon bought them, I, I have a hard time believing that we don't look back in retrospect and go, this was an incredible bold move from a person who had a lot to lose in that moment. I have no reason to believe that the data is going to suggest otherwise. And again, it, it just like saying after 12 months of seeing the logo, oh, it's really nice now, but I'm not supposed to look back a year ago when the guy, you know, posted publicly that it sucked and that it was stupid and a terrible idea. I have to wonder 12 months from now, 18 months from now, when everybody's using the quote unquote everything app for a whole lot of stuff in their life and businesses are joining it up that they don't look back and go, that was, that was an incredibly risky, bold move that really kind of caught the attention and captivated people for months. Yeah. The thing that you threw out there that, that I think is worth camping out on for a second is the idea that effectively the things that he owns are sub brands to his personal brand. 
And, uh, you know, maybe this is obvious, but you know, I don't expect that he's done <laughs> by any stretch. <laughs> I mean, no. all of the things that he has happening right now, especially with a new CEO at the helm, I think once he gets this to a point where it doesn't have his primary focus anymore, curious to see what's next, what's the next thing. And I don't expect him to, to suddenly move to safe mode and to do things below the radar. Like everything, as you mentioned, everything he touches, he kind of does this with his level of Elon. Again, if, if you or I were advising him in maybe both of those scenarios, it would look differently, but, um, this is, this is him doing him. Yeah. It's the most on brand thing he could do. And that that's the thing that I think everybody is missing. And of course I don't expect them to have that attitude towards it because most people don't, you know, think about it on that level, but that is what we're watching. That is what we're seeing happen. And, you know, I, I don't want to be flippant with the idea that, you know, it's just this little new play thing or something. I mean, Twitter had brand equity. People mm -hmm. absolutely came to expect what Twitter was supposed to be about. And again, that logical extension idea would be that we would try to hope, you know, bring those people along for that story. Because to your point earlier, internally, it is it is a big problem when you drag people along with you in a way that that makes them feel like you don't care about them, their input and their sacrifice to to the greater cause as well. Right. Well, fans feel the same way. Users can feel that same way that, you know, wait, you pulled the rug out from under us. I vouched for you like you completely pivoted in this way. That is not at all what I came to expect from you. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that interesting duality between you don't own your brand, that the audience owns your brand. And a, a, again, a once in a lifetime phenom style individual like Elon, who says, I will burn the entire thing to the ground and start from the first user again, if I have to, that that's some, that's a signal that I think, again, perhaps people can't articulate it that way, but it, there are certainly a number of people who have a visceral reaction to wait a second, this isn't the experience I signed up for. And you just took it away from me and replace it with this new thing. It feels like I'm being imposed upon. And that's, <laughs> that's scary for a lot of people. They don't like that feeling. Well, I think too, um, I don't know if we want to go all the way down the, the X rabbit hole, cause there's so much we talk about here, but you know, there, de there's definitely the other point of view on this whole thing, which is, uh, the narrative that Elon is just tanking a successful company and that the product's going to downward spiral and that threads is going to eat their lunch. Um, <laughs> now, I, so I was a very early Twitter user and, you know, I used to say in my bio that I was a caffeine and Twitter addict. And a few years ago, I realized like, I'm not even really on Twitter all that much anymore. I should probably take that out of my bio. Um, so I'm, I'm really not the guy to ask because I'm not in their day-to-day -day posting and interacting the same, the same level. I am often looking, <laughs> looking, lurking, but I just am not producing content or posting in there like I, like I was. So, um, you know, obviously anything could happen and Elon could literally decide to shut it down tomorrow and make it something completely different. But assuming this X continues at some level in the, at least in the, uh, kind of the, the spirit of what Twitter has been, uh, what's your prediction for what that, that market looks like two, five years from now? Hmm. I love that you're asking me to predict when I, again, I'm kind of resistant to these ideas. I think I can look at trend lines. Well, I, I think it's the public square idea that that to me has always been the core. That's Twitter's brand. That's mm -hmm. supposed to be Twitter's brand. That's that's what caused this whole mess is once it became clear that they weren't interested in, bec in being the town square anymore. They were interested in it being a propagandized, you know, filter that says you can say this but not that right and and this is the broader picture that everybody needs to understand is to be very clear about this elon is an absolute lightning rod he is a phenom he has become so ubiquitous that he can literally simultaneously be god and satan to people like it this is just the way it is people have got to understand that they are falling into a binary thinking trap where you can literally go down conspiracy rabbit holes about how elon works for the illuminati and you can literally go the opposite direction where Elon is sent by God to save humanity. This is the kind of crap that is just, you can't, 
this speaks to the power of brand. I mean, Elon has the strongest personal brand of any living individual right now. It's why the headlines can't, they just can't afford to not talk about him because the, the people flock to that name. And, and so clickbait central, here we go. We have to talk about Elon. I firmly believe that the praise and criticism of him is largely political in nature. We unfortunately fall in America, at least, into these stupid binary left and right ideas all the time. And if somebody is on the proverbial crap list of the left, suddenly they're the darling of the right and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And there's no nuance left. We can't talk about what is actually happening behind the scenes. It's silly. It's ridiculous. You and I both despise the whole thing, I know. With all of that said, I tried to analyze what are we looking at as a product set? And right now, what we have to work with is what used to be Twitter was the public square. And Elon has been very vocal about how he wants censorship to be as thinly layered as humanly possible. We obviously have seen instances where he personally has said, no, later, you're not on here and made the like King, <laughs> you know, George like decision. I'm to not going to censor except for that guy. <laughs> exactly. Screw that guy. Yeah, we don't censor, but that guy's a dick later. So <laughs> that's where we are right now. Um, I'm not. I'm not under any illusion that there's not some level of censorship and there's some really interesting conversations that we all need to have there. And, and I am a 100%, you know, First Amendment, free speech kind of human right up into the moment that you're like legitimately trying to incite, you know, active pain or whatever those legal mm -hmm. frameworks are. We have them clearly established in America. I don't think it's that big of a like it's very easy to go back and see where the lines are. Twitter in the past absolutely stepped over those lines plenty of times and just simply wasn't consistent and people didn't know where to go. That's what started this whole thing. And the reason I bring that up is because Elon felt compelled because of his own desire to see free speech um, perpetuated or whatever, established, reestablished in America. That really was what drove him to purchase it and take it. Then you have the opportunistic side of, well, what can I do with an app like that, with that user base and with that sort of functionality? And again, it started as the public square. Well, he's been very clear that he wants it to be the everything app. And people have, you know, compared it to other apps, um, you know, and the ability to like pay for things immediately and easily uh, to be able to sign up for subscriptions, to be able to post your products, to be able to publish newsletters, to be able to host video. Like this is the place where you go to exist and share with other people and exchange and do commerce, you know, et cetera. That's exciting. That's really exciting. Snapchat doesn't do that. Instagram doesn't do that. You know, threads is hilarious to me. Sorry, any thread users, but I largely believe that the people that went over there were the ones that just don't like Elon and are looking for an alternative. And that's okay. No problem. You know, there will be a contingency of people over there, but from a purely functional program or application, it's woefully incompetent. And I don't see how Zuck's world is any better <laughs> personally. Hey. So that's my own personal take two to five years from now. Um, I look back in the past to form trajectory lines to the future if I'm trying to think about what comes ahead. I do this on a professional level all the time for companies, but I often have a very complete data set. I don't have that data set here. I can only extrapolate from my assumptions of what I've seen him do in other companies, what I've heard him publicly state, and taking him for his word in a way that I don't and you know this about me, I don't do the whole like starstruck thing. Like I, I don't, for whatever reason, people don't like make me feel, ooh, you know, like there's very few people that can make me feel like I don't use logic when I assess what they're doing. When I look at Elon, I see no reason whatsoever to believe he's going to fail this. The idea that it's going to shut down and go away and fail in disaster is completely stupid and has been from the beginning. That I will say publicly. I have no problem saying that. The people who want that to happen don't like Elon and want him to fail. That's where the sentiment is coming from. It's insane. Aside from that, um, I see no reason to believe whatsoever that he and Linda and the team that she's going to continue to build is not going to pull off the quote unquote everything app. And it's going to take maybe a year to two years to really sink in. And I think more and more businesses are going to flood to it. I think depending on <laughs> depending on Elon, because again, that is the risk. He is tied to the brand. You'll never be able to separate X from him now, just like you can't SpaceX, just like you can't Tesla. Um, he's always the X factor, right? Ha ha. Um, <laughs> I but see what um, you did there. so I can't predict anything from him, you know, 
but other than that he, he'll stay interesting but the I, I i yes i believe that it will become more and more useful over time and more and more people will flood to it and it'll be very difficult for the average person to resist it if they are an independent creator business owner or somehow want to connect with others to provide an exchange value let's try to climb a little bit out of the x hole here um and back up brand so it's still related to this this topic though is you know we talk all the time about if you're trying to position your firm your company your product your service you can't be everything for everybody and it's interesting that part of the the pitch for this is the x for everything app so what can could should elon and company do to like does it all stay as one thing is x always just x and every feature they add once it's payment and it makes julian fries like <laughs> when it does all the stuff are you still going to call it x or does it does it suddenly have all the pieces in the way that facebook and google both kind of backed out to be alphabet and meta and then they have all these smaller products um something tells me elon won't do that <laughs> because it's what everybody else does and it's what traditional wisdom says uh what's your take on how he makes it x for everything does he keep it x does he break it out how does that work yeah i have been thinking about this and you're absolutely right we're back to that parent child brand sub brand architecture discussion and i have often wondered that like what if what if x becomes the broader idea and then twitter is the sort of town square part and then there's these other you know um I picture that Google grid where you go in your Gmail and you hit the grid on the top right and you're suddenly inundated with whatever, 82 sub app yeah, products, right. right? And you're like, I can do sheets and docs and I can do all these oh, things. I, I, all I these am things? with you. What was that one? I have all these things. The, yeah. This, and this, this was here this whole time. And this, and this, and they're very powerful, um, but they speak to this bloated megacorp, you know, it, when you get to their level of dollars internally going, sure, you can have $12 million to play with. Go ahead, spin off your little, you know, uh, developer team and go play with that. Mm -hmm. 12 is a laughably low number. It's probably a hundred, but whatever. Um, I'm with you. My gut is no way. He won't do that at all. It will be X. It will stay X. It will include everything. And it will be spoken about as one cohesive thing so that people don't begin to silo their usage of it into just one little thing. Well, I kind of use the town square or what was twitter thing to post my fun little ideas and i don't really use anything else like certainly usership will be up or down on the feature set just like every other product but um but no i think the 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 brand and the way that we're going to talk about this thing is going to continue to be x um it feels like it's his most fundamental pipe dream of all which is to look at the all of humanity on earth and mars and go they all use x I think that idea to him makes him very happy. Yeah, you know, uh, related to the little Google grid thing, I used to tell clients, like, show me your homepage and I can tell you all about the political infighting and which department has the power and which ones you're placating and it would blow people's minds. <laughs> because you look at a homepage and say, oh, what are the things that don't belong here? What, Where does it feel like we start to drift away from the main story? And, uh, and, and you can just tell like, oh, well, we'll let that department have a thing here and we'll have this go here. And, you know, all these distractions that they get away from the main point. But, uh, that was always a fun game. Funny how the truth always comes out, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I, you're totally right. And it all the way down to their copywriting and the way they talk about, you know, and prioritize their, you know, marketing speak and what is important to them. And, you know, it is back to why so much of this gets diluted by the time that it gets to the public which is really interesting and you know i do want to <clears throat> maybe maybe this is where i bring back another point is i often um back up when i talk about brand all the way back to the fundamental layer like i i, I talk about like brand is the biggest circle you can draw around any organization like mm -hmm. in other words everything is about brand and the reason that that I try to do that is, A, I fundamentally believe that because if you're going to align anything you say about it, you should probably align that to the truth. 
And I've been around way too many business owners and just people in general who seem to believe that as long as they think they can control the perception, the reality doesn't matter. And unfortunately, a great number of those people are in our profession, <laughs> design right. and marketing, communications, <laughs> et cetera. And, you know, we certainly have contentious attitudes towards that, to say the least, because for me, the fundamental cornerstone of all branding and marketing should be truth, period. We should never say we do something we don't. Um, when it comes to the fundamental layer of the branding, you know, I think about this idea that there's still the, the, the first level of interfacing. Like when somebody sees a campaign for the first time, a marketing campaign, and they don't have any awareness whatsoever of that brand, but they see that campaign and it's really well done. Let's say it really tugs on their heartstrings and speaks to them because they're in their target audience and it just resonates with them. As long as the company is like actually truthfully speaking about who they are, you know, I could use a brand name, but I don't want to skew it. Like just pick anybody's favorite brand. Like the first time you heard about them was probably a marketing or some sort of advertising or something if they were big enough. Th you know, that that's really a critical function. Like That's really, really important. Like I don't want to come across as ever like downplaying that because again, we are emotional creatures who interface with our world emotionally and later justify with logic. We all That's the pattern that we are always in, which is why branding and marketing is like a superpower, because we understand that. We know that to the core. So we can take all of the logic and all of the things that are very math-driven and just formulaic and turn those into magic, right? They feel like magic when they pull on somebody's emotional heartstrings. That's yeah, something that... Once you start to pull all those pieces together, it's like, how'd you do that? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. How'd you do that? And and the thing is, I want my clients to understand how I did that. Mm -hmm. I want them to understand because it will empower them to take the next step internally, which it then turns around and gives me something better to talk about. That's why it's so critical for me to give them a 120-page brand strategy book before we even design a single thing. That's so freaking critical to me. And I want them to understand that process. If it's if it feels like magic to them, I let me be careful how I say this. I love that it feels like magic to them when it does happen, because there's always the layer of being able to create all that visual stuff that most people aren't able to do. I think about the video that you just created mere days ago at the conference we were at, mm -hmm. where we were shooting video live, and literally in a day half a day you took something that completely did not exist to compiling it all in a timeline and put together this amazing you know what was it roughly a minute promotional mm -hmm. piece with music and bumper reel and like everything in it that was just like phenomenal i mean literally after it showed toward the end of the conference everybody started clapping because they watched the screen and in real time that's me that was me last night holy crap and think about just how much more that Amplified, there you go. The conference was called yeah. Amplify, so I'm using this <laughs> word. Think about how much more that amplified their experience. How much more special that moment became that like they even took the time to build something like that to recap in real time what they just assume normally would take weeks for people to turn and do. And you turned it in a matter of hours and pulled those emotional heartstrings. That feels like magic. Yeah. Right? And that I is think magic. That's such a cool thing about that particular brand for the conference is how they every year every year they look at what other lovers and whatever other things can we apply to this that up the experience for this so they they don't think about it as a convention or a conference or a meeting they think about it as an experience so what can we do that's going to surprise and delight what are the the little things that you know as you said when people watch that recap video it sinks in pretty quickly because they see things that happened yesterday and the day before and they're like oh and that's me i saw me in that video or i saw yes. that person that i saw on stage or my friend was in that video and i know that that all happened during this week and it just blows their mind that all those things are happening and it reminds them of all those little touch points that really make that experience special uh and i just love it when when brands and companies uh well, as as my first art director told me, paint the inside of the mailbox. It's like the little things that maybe nobody notices until you go to look yourself and then you see that all those details were thought about. I love that, man. And that word special, that word special comes in. It's special because it feels magical. It feels like I didn't expect that. How did they get there? How did they conclude that that would work? And yet on the client side, 
that's a very tactical discussion. You know, hey, we're going to build this thing. We're going to produce it and we're going to get it to the AV team so they can put it up the next morning. And it's going to cause this effect. It costs this amount of money. It's going to include this kind of content and it's going to create this sort of output, you know, like this sort of reaction from the crowd, which it completely did. Right. So we once again find ourselves constantly in this mix of logic and emotion, you know, this magic and this science that continue to kind of interplay and happen. And that's something that I, again, I don't want to ever downplay that side of it because I have a tendency to, because I think so many people want, um, I call, okay, so let me talk about this for a second. And this actually speaks back to our idea of imposing these things on other people. When we talk about the idea of a rebrand, I have this thing that I call the HGTV effect. And I don't know if HGTV is as popular as it used to be, but they had this <laughs> show where they would remodel the house, totally renovate it with the owners weren't living there. I don't even you know see what this G- is called. Gen Z fans. There used to be this thing called network television and cable. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. People would sit in front of this light box and wait through commercials to watch this show. Anyway, in this show, they would pick homeowners. They would say, we're going to completely transform how your house looks. You're going to go away for three days or whatever, and we're going to redo it. And then at the end, they bring these people up. They park this giant, stupid bus in front of them so they can't see their house. And then they go, move that bus. And the bus moves and they see their new home. And they're like, oh, my God. And these people call themselves designers the whole time. And that always really like offended my sensibility because like <laughs> design is a process that you solve problems for people. You work together. You would never in a million years do the stupid corporate dog and pony. I've got the sheet over the easel. Are you guys ready? Here you go. Wow. That's the dumbest crap I've ever heard. And I hate it. I despise it. I also did it completely absent of the client. So like the client doesn't get their home. Just like we just decided on all the things. And then we went ahead and did them while you were gone. Surprise. I hope you like it. And that imagine whole, if we did that with a corporate rebrand, dude, people do. That's the problem. That's what it drives me nuts is that. And then they call that a rebrand. That's <laughs> what drives me crazy because we are. So the HGTV effect problem for me is now you have this, uh, thank God nobody watches it anymore, but you used to have millions of people watching these people call themselves designers and they go, mm-hmm. that's what design looks like. You delight them with the dog and pony show and the grand reveal and everybody claps. And then they expect to go into a corporate boardroom and do the same thing. And unfortunately, because the client expects them to do that same thing. And I'll know it when I see it, Josh. I'll know that logo when I see it, buddy. Don't you worry. I don't know if you remember this or not, but like we were both in like kind of national AIGA leadership circles years ago. And there was a little bit of a sentiment nationally of like, hey, AIGA owners of design and promotion and all of these things for what designers do. Why don't we have a show that's like one of these HGTV shows where we walk the client through the thing? And and I'm so glad that never happened because chances are it would have just fit that same pattern of what the HGTV shows were, which was like, tell me the thing. I go away into my cave you see all my wacky stuff on television, hilarity ensues, and then I reveal it to you and you love it. Well, that's it's just not how it works. If the producers were involved, it definitely would have ended up that way. That's the problem is, is these, this, so the excitement of that, right? Like that, that feels like opening a birthday present. That's exciting. Every single human on the freaking planet knows the feeling of being handed a wrapped package and not knowing what's inside and opening it, Mm -hmm. and the delight when it's a thing that they love. But they don't tell the story of when they open it and it sucks. (laughs) And then you're in a corporate marketing group with eight people with all their own opinions, and you never took them through the process to solve an actual problem, and then you just literally want to jump out the window. (laughs) You know, It's funny, that's often the metaphor that I use with clients is, uh, you know, your aunt may have bought you an exquisite sweater for Christmas and it's really nicely made and it's not cheap and it it's, it's good quality. But if you put it on and you're like, this just isn't a sweater that I would wear. Like that's part of the brand too, is like all of the elements, all of the visuals, all of the things that company, that leadership team has got to be like, 
we're going to wear this sweater and we're going to wear it proudly. And you can't just blindly go make a thing for somebody and hand it to them and hope that it's going to be a thing that's going to resonate with them. Exactly. Not to mention you want, you want your customers and your, uh, your clients to be excited to see that sweater too. That's right. And that goes back to my idea of alignment. The more that the leadership has made that crystal clear from the very beginning through every single piece top down of their corporation and their entity, the more that the customers are going to resonate and align with that from the beginning. And again, I'll think of some, you think of something like Patagonia and these big brands, it's hard to relate to the big brands. And I don't like to use them because for a $10 million company, a $20 million company, a solopreneur, like mm -hmm. everybody loves to talk about these massive tech, you know, hundred million dollar freaking over 10 year budgets for building these brands out and then think, well, what can I learn from Apple? It's like, well, there's a lot to learn, but it's not the same thing. You know, the, we have to implement that very differently when we have like, I don't know, $10,000, you know, that's a different right. thing, the different set of priorities. When we're talking about normal everyday small businesses and, and perhaps too, that this is the other problem. Like not everybody's a big giant national retail brand. We love using those because they're the most front facing and they're the often sexiest ones, right? But what about the $500 million, you know, manufacturing company who has an excellent reputation and builds, you know, whatever steel boxes for all kinds of different, you know, architectural things and they need to establish their brand. Now what, you know, like mm -hmm. if you look like Nike, that's a problem, you know, that doesn't make any sense. But if you look like trust, reliability, accuracy on target on, you know, brand all or, um, you know, on budget and all that stuff all the time, your brand is going to be very strong inside of the person who has to purchase that for their next high rise. That that's the kind of stuff that I just go back to constantly with the idea of alignment. And, and you can, we've seen this a million times when you have a, a leadership, say, uh, CEO and maybe even a marketing director. And they have been talking forever and building all this stuff out, but they don't communicate any of these things from the team. They don't extract any data from the team to make them part of the process. They never communicated these values to the rest of the team, but now they're going to launch a marketing campaign that says we do X and mm -hmm. no pun intended to Elon's X, <laughs> whatever. Um, you know, so we're going to do these things. Well, how many times have we watched an internal team roll their eyes and go, whatever, like if they knew what we, you know, if I told people what our department does, they would never say that we're that, you know, that th th we have watched so many brands self-destruct themselves from the inside out because there's no alignment internally and therefore there can't be any alignment externally. And then it gets back to the third problem, which is the window dressing problem. And so maybe we should unpack that for a second, or as I like to call it, putting lipstick on a pig, but we'll talk about window <laughs> dressing fire away. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, yeah, the, the window dressing thing is just, here's the problem. It's like, it's like in nature when, when you see a ripe piece of fruit and you take a bite out of it, you expect that it tastes ripe in the grocery store. We get these modified things that <laughs> they pump color into and you take a bite out of it. It's not ripe. I'm kind of a melon snob this week. I've got some, <laughs> some very fresh watermelon and it's, fantastic i love really ripe grapefruit uh, i could go down that path for a long time but um when you this happens with a brand though when you signal things are different things are better and then you go experience the brand and you realize nothing has changed and in fact maybe it's worse or it's more of the same um i think there's nothing that's going to give the market a, a worse taste for the brand than one that signals new, better, improved, and you roll in and and it's anything but that. Exactly right, man. And we're filled with puns here today with <laughs> bad taste in their <laughs> mouth, indeed. I, I think your I, I think people instinctively understand it because it's dishonest. It's it, it's the third. I, I jumped from the first to the third because we still have to land the plane on the three different types. But the 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 third being the problem is we know and understand that they're trying to manipulate people. That's really the problem. And this is the thing that mm -hmm. you've heard me um, again. I have I, I don't do well with filters, as you know, um, I try very hard for YouTube to throw filters onto some of this stuff because turns out they like the filters. But um, listen, the corporate communications world is a smarmy and nasty, disgusting place. So is sales, right? So is marketing like it can be completely 
um, dishonest snake oil salesman garbage nonstop from top to bottom of people who believe that they can be so persuasive and that they can convince people to do things without worrying mm -hmm. about whether or not those things actually fulfill on the promises that you promise them. That is disgusting. I know you hate it. I know I hate it. And just like that piece of fruit that you bite into and it's rotten and disgusting or as benign as, well, you told me it tasted different. And this okay. is exactly the same taste I've always had. Like, well, now I feel weird about this. It's not even as overt as you lied. It's like, well, now something's fishy. Something's weird, man. So we have to be very careful about that. And unfortunately, I believe that's where most people in the client space are. That's what they're looking for. They're going, hey, we need a shot in the arm. We just need a refresh. We need a light. We need a mini brand refresh, Josh. That's what we need. We got about 30 grand for a mini brand refresh. You know, that's going to be a, a whole different episode. Oh, man. Well, yeah, Tori will need to calm down between now and then. But, you know, these these are the problems is, you know, then we come in and we're like, hey, what what has changed? Like, what can we hook to? Like, we need things that actually did change so we can talk about how they really change. And then you find out mm -hmm. most of the time they just simply haven't. You're 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 really asking um the CEO to fundamentally do the job that he's supposed to be or she's supposed to be doing from the beginning. And this is something that I, you know, um, it pops up every now and then because I'll see egocentric CEOs who butt heads with their marketing department. Inevitably, you've seen this, I've seen this a million times. They'll hire somebody into marketing who's actually quite good. And so the marketer says, okay, I'm the person who has to go out there and say all of these things are true. So let's start talking about them. How do we do this? You know, one you say we're really good at, at this one thing. How are we really good at that? And the CEO knows that they're not really that good at it, right? And even if he doesn't know, he knows that he doesn't know and he should. Either way, that makes that that CEO is gonna feel kind of like uh resistant. And then you have a list of like 30 of those things, and you start going down the list, and now there's friction. The CEO doesn't like that the the marketing person says, I don't want to lie. So I need to make sure that we actually do these things. Well, that puts a lot of pressure on the CEO because now he's overwhelmed. She's overwhelmed with the amount of change that needs to happen. And then they go, why can't you just go look good? Why can't you just go say it? Could you please just go do that for me? I have my own problems. And that's that friction. And we've seen it a million times. And every single freaking time, the marketer is just trying to get to the core of the truth and say, I just don't want to say that we're something we're not. That's it. And they either get fired or they move on because that's one of the most frustrating places to be. We as outside vendors experience that all the time when we come in and go, hey, is that actually true? Because <laughs> I don't want to say it if it's not true. And it's hard for us because we have to trust them sometimes. We don't always have that data, right? That's I think very that's different. That's why I like that second kind the best as a client, which is things are already good. Like exactly. there's, there's not this elephant in the boardroom that you got to deal with, uh, in things that you need to fix and culture, you have to rewire the culture is great. Like we've just been around a really long time and we don't look as great to the market as I know we are. We've been working on ourselves this whole time. And it's really just about how do you level up that exterior to match with what's already happening on the inside? Those are just, those clients are a pleasure to work with. That is it. You're in a uh, nice segue. Nice segue, Josh. The, the you're right. They are the best because now the alignment problem isn't an honesty problem. It's not a substantive problem. The alignment problem is, oh, well, you've just been building pressure underground this whole time to use my geyser thing, but you've got this like massive lid on the geyser. The people are there like they're they're here for the show. Like you read. Come on, let's come. Let's get that thing off of here so they can see the show. Right. It becomes the 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 alignment on the outside of what's already been happening on the inside, and I think that that's really uh, to your point. As people who love that sort of transformation visually and verbally, and all of the things that we get to do at the tip of the spear to show it off to the public and to the market and the target audience, that's a really exciting place to be, and a very enthusiastic place for a lot of the team members too, because they've been dying to see it. So they mm -hmm. love, they feel proud. They feel like, oh, that is us. This is so cool to see this all coming together. How many times have you gone through that style of quote unquote rebrand and you literally have watched it take the team from just kind of existing to like, this is the coolest thing I've ever been part of. Oh, just elated and so proud to see it out there because, because you're not second guessing yourself. You're not like, well, 
let's see if this works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, you already know things are good. It's just it, even even when that's accompanied by a new name, you know, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't even that the name can even be part of that because you already know that the the product, the service, the people, the culture, everything else is already really, really strong. So I'll tie let's do this. Let's tie this up with that. The X rebrand. Mm -hmm. That's what I suspect it is. And I think the people who have weathered the storm from the transition, who have come on since, who've stick, stuck around and said, I'm, I'm with you, because make no mistake, there has been a lot of external pressure on anybody who's been willing to work for Elon and stay there under this you know, company rebrand banner and, and developing these new products. I think, if anything, the value of this change and these continual changes, and by the way, to the point, Linda, you know, the CEO, just said in an interview with CNBC last week, she specifically said, and this is almost word for word, quote, as Elon continues to accelerate the rebrand, then she starts talking about her changes. This is after X logo came out. So yeah. she knows, she knows what a rebrand really is, that changing a logo in this case, just because is not a rebrand. She knows that this has been an ongoing process since he brought in the sink and won't end probably until he's no longer involved or whatever, because that's just Elon, <laughs> but that this is a process that has been unfolding for a great deal of time. Did and that he's working to you accelerate. You put the sign on the building, you put the sign up here, you take the sign down. <laughs> yeah, that's put all the part of the whole up. thing. It's all, again, because that that is an expression of Elon's brand. That's what people have to understand. It's, mm. it's kind of like trotting the team out to do something. <laughs> it's like, no, this is for me. <laughs> you know, but it's a statement. And internally, the people who are there, I'm just going to go ahead and suspect they don't want to work for Twitter. They stayed because they want to work for Elon and they believe in the vision moving forward. This is a massive, massive piece of red meat thrown right to them to go, your part is something way bigger than that bird app thing that we shot because we're done with, you know? And that's something that people don't understand. Everybody's out on the outside, like, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And they don't understand that that internal team needs to be cohesive and on the same page with the vision. And mm -hmm. especially when you're working under somebody like Elon, whose vision can be very grand and not always perhaps the best uh, defined in the moment and perhaps volatile, right? Which is a right. strength and a weakness. So when you're in, on the coattails of that, trying to make sure you're building something powerful, you want to have something you can believe in. The last thing you should be doing is looking backwards. And I think that that's really the strength of this. So, so, so to answer the question that you asked me earlier, uh, I believe that this is a quote unquote phase two, stage two rebrand or whatever we want to call it, type two. And which is the best, you know, kind really in this sense. Um, uh, and, and, and I think it's just going to continue to unroll from there. I mean, I, I don't see any lid on this thing. No, it's just time to run the ball. Time to run that ball, maybe. By the way, <laughs> that's full circle. <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a great quote, you know, um, about risk mitigation and, you know, how to go about it. But I summing up everything it's, it's for me, um, it's just always about alignment. You do not want the things you're saying about your company, the connections you're trying to make and the foundations of those connections, the the expectations, the pretenses that, fo that form and define those expectations. You want them to align with the truth. You don't want them to be too far ahead or too far behind. Or, you know, if, if again, if uh, Nike is branded like that manufacturing company who's crushing it in their own space or vice versa, those aren't true for them. It doesn't work for yeah. them and that's okay. It just, you need to know what works for you and push that for you and then make sure that you're just fulfilling on the promises you're making on the front end. Well, speaking of what works for us, we're both in the midst of uh, a bit of a studio refresh. So <laughs> perhaps the next episode, you'll see different things back here, which I'm sure makes all the difference in the world. And that's exactly why people are turning in. Tuning in is just to see what's behind them in the room. Are you telling me you're going to rebrand next shoot, Josh? Is that what I'm hearing? It might get worse before it gets better, but it's yeah. it's going to be different anyhow. Well, I'm not holding myself to it, but it is in the works soon. Excellent. And uh, we'll get there, but yeah, buddy, this is a good one. I, I love the discussion um, 
and just again for viewers we don't script any of this stuff we don't even talk about it much beforehand because we know we'll just sit and talk for six we hours hardly and even like, think about it yeah exactly and and we need it to be that way this is just what happens when the two of us get together <laughs> exactly and this is an excuse for us to get together and talk about these <laughs> things um so you know again we'll continue to to unpack a ton about branding but that rebrand thing you know it's it's just in the lexicon right now and i think it needed to be addressed and i'm glad that we hit it yeah if uh people have ideas about what we should cover on a future episode again we we don't do lots of scripting here but uh but we'll put it in consideration so let tori know on twitter or mention it in the youtube comments and we'll we'll take a look all right brother talk to you soon good to see you brother all right bye bye